book of the Revelation of Jesus. The author of this book, which is not called Revelations, by the way, is named at the beginning. It was written by John, which could refer to the beloved disciple who wrote the Gospel and the letters of John, or it could be a different John, a Messianic Jewish prophet who traveled about and taught in the early church. Whichever John it was, he makes clear in the opening paragraph what kind of book he has written. He calls it, first of all, a revelation or apocalypse. The Greek word is apokalypsis, and it refers to a type of literature very familiar to John's readers from the Hebrew scriptures and from other popular Jewish texts. Apocalypse has recounted a prophet's symbolic dreams and visions that revealed God's heavenly perspective on history and current events so that the present could be viewed in light of history's final outcome. And John says this apocalypse is a prophecy, which means it's a word from God spoken through a prophet to God's people, usually to warn or comfort them in a time of crisis. By calling this book a prophecy, John's saying that it stands in the tradition of the biblical prophets and is bringing their message to a climax. And this apocalyptic prophecy was sent to real people that John knew. The book opens and closes as a circular letter that was sent to seven churches in the ancient Roman province of Asia. Now, seven is a meaningful number for John. It's a symbol of completeness based on the seven-day Sabbath cycle in the Old Testament, and John has woven sevens into every single part of this book. Now, with this opening, John has given us clear guidance about how he wants us to understand this book. Jewish apocalypse is communicated through symbolic imagery and numbers. It is not a secret predictive code about the timing of the end of the world. Rather, John is constantly using these symbols that are drawn from the Old Testament, and he expects his readers to go discover what the symbols mean by looking up the text he's alluding to. Also, the fact that it's a letter means that John is actually addressing the situation of these first century churches. And so while this book has much to say to Christians of later generations, the book's meaning must first be anchored in the historical context of John's time, place, and audience. Which brings us into the book's first section, Jesus' message to the seven churches. John was exiled on the island of Patmos, and he saw a vision of the risen Jesus, exalted as king of the world. And he was standing among seven burning lights. And John's told this is a symbol of the seven churches in Asia Minor that's been adapted from the book of the prophet Zechariah. And Jesus starts addressing the specific problems that face each church. Some were apathetic due to wealth and affluence. Others were morally compromised. Their people were still eating ritual meals and sleeping around in pagan temples. But others among the churches remained faithful to Jesus, and they were suffering harassment and even violent persecution. And Jesus warns that things are going to get worse. A tribulation is upon the churches that will force them to choose between compromise or faithfulness. By John's day, the murder of Christians by the Roman Emperor Nero was passed, and the persecution of Christians by Emperor Domitian was likely underway. And so the temptation was to deny Jesus, either to avoid persecution or simply to join the spirit of the Roman age. And Jesus calls them to faithfulness so that they can overcome or literally conquer. And Jesus promises a reward for everyone in these churches who does conquer. Each reward is drawn directly from the book's final vision about the marriage of heaven and earth. And so this opening section, it sets up the main plot tension that will drive the storyline in this book. Will Jesus' people endure? Will they inherit the new world that God has in store? And why is faithfulness to Jesus described as conquering? The rest of the book is John's answer. After this, John has a vision of God's heavenly throne room, and he describes it with imagery drawn from many Old Testament prophets. Surrounding God are creatures and elders that represent all creation and human nations, and they're giving honor and allegiance to the one true creator God who is holy, holy, holy. Revelation chapter 4, beginning in verse 1. After this I looked, and behold, a door standing open in heaven, and the first voice which I had heard speaking to me like a trumpet said, Come up here, and I will show you what must take place after this. At once I was in the Spirit, and behold, a throne stood in heaven with one seated on the throne, and he who sat there had the appearance of Jasper and Carnelian. And around the throne was a rainbow that had the appearance of an emerald. Around the throne were twenty-four thrones, and seated on the thrones were twenty-four elders, clothed in white garments with golden crowns on their heads. From the throne came flashes of lightning and rumblings and peals of thunder, 
and before the throne were burning seven torches of fire, which are the seven spirits of God. And before the throne there was, as it were, a sea of glass, like crystal. And around the throne, on each side of the throne, are four living creatures, full of eyes in front and behind. The first living creature, like a lion. A second living creature, like an ox. The third living creature with the face of a man, and the fourth living creature like an eagle in flight. And the four living creatures, each of them with six wings, are full of eyes all around and within. And day and night they never cease to say, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. And whenever the living creatures give glory and honor and thanks to him who is seated on the throne, who lives forever and ever, the 24 elders fall down before him who is seated on the throne and worship him who lives forever and ever. They, they cast their crowns before the throne, saying, Worthy are you, our Lord and God, to receive glory and honor and power. For you created all things, and by your will they existed and were created. John passes out in chapter 1 when he is given a glimpse of the glorified Son of Man right before his face, blazing forth like the sun shining at full strength. Every system of his whole being shut down through sensory overload. And this should be a clue to us about what lies ahead in this book. Chapters 2 and 3 help us begin to understand that a spiritually healthy church builds its whole ministry on this beautiful, blazing, sword mouth, piercing eye, glorious being with the keys to death and Hades. And those churches among us that lose this first primary love, those who begin to tolerate deviations from his truth, and who marginalize him outside the door and fail to cultivate intimacy with him, soon discover that he comes to oppose them with all of his limitless power and authority. But of all that is, all of that has been in those first three chapters, prelude to the revelation for which this book was named, the revelation that begins to be articulated here in chapter 4. What surprises me anytime I spend time in the revelation to John is how deadly serious a book it is. But if we remember that it is written to a suffering church that is most likely wondering why Jesus has not returned yet. A suffering church that is beginning to pay for its allegiance to Christ with its blood and lives. When we remember that, we understand the need for a serious tone because when you have been forcibly torn away from your children, or when your church chairman was run through with the sword last week, you're not interested in fluffy Christian self-help bestsellers. You need truth. You need an understanding of reality that is worthy of your death. The whole foundation for this kind of reality is laid down in chapters 4 and 5. 
structurally and thematically. It has its roots in Daniel 7, 1 to 14. If you believe the content of the 11 verses of chapter 4, if you believe that this content constitutes reality, your life will never be the same if you come to believe that. Now, when I say you believe what is written here, I am defining belief in a very specific way. Belief means this, a readiness to act as if what is believed were so. That kind of faith. It's more than just head knowledge. Impress you with my biblical, intellectual, acumen kind of faith. If you say you believe what is taught in this chapter, then you have to be ready to live as if this really were the case. The formal part of the revelation then begins in verse 1 with an open door to heaven. After this I looked and behold a door standing open in heaven. And the first voice which I had heard speaking to me like a trumpet, said, Come up here, and I will show you what must take place after this. So let's break down the revelation here. After this is not marking a historical sequence, it's marking visionary sequence. In other words, John saw this vision after he saw the vision of the seven churches recorded in chapters 2 and 3. The vision here begins with an open door. An open door into heaven. I don't want to take definitions for granted here. When we talk about heaven, let's uh, unpack that for a bit. N.T. Wright says, What do you think of when you read about a door in heaven? For years, he said, I imagine that John looked up to the sky and he saw far away, tiny but bright little distant star, he saw there an open door through which he was invited to enter into the heavenly world. I think of it quite differently now. Heaven and earth are not, in biblical theology, separated by a great gulf, as they are in much popular imagination. Heaven, God's sphere of reality, is right here, close beside us, intersecting with our ordinary reality. It is not so much like a door opening high in the sky, far away. It is like a door opening right in front of us, where before we could only see this room, or this field, or this street. And the invitation right here, the door opens, leading into a different world, and then he hears the invitation, come on up, come on up. See what's going on. This is not, as some people have supposed, anything to do with God's people being snatched away to heaven to avoid awful events that are about to take place on earth. It is instead a prophet being taken into God's throne room so that he can see behind the scenes and understand both what is going to take place and then how it all fits together and makes sense. Packer adds his own description of heaven. To think of heaven as a place is more right than wrong, though the the word could be uh, misleading. Heaven appears in scripture, Scripture as a spatial reality that touches and interpenetrates all created space. So when we talk about heaven, 
We're talking about God's sphere of reality. We're talking about a spatial reality that touches and interpenetrates all of created space. It is a real place, not just a state of mind. Perhaps think of it as a different realm or a different dimension, but here, it's here now, not in some far off galaxy somewhere. Heaven is where the reign of God is fully realized. It is the kingdom that we pray for. When we ask for His kingdom to come and that His will would be done here on earth the way it's being done in heaven right now. How we think about this matters lest we compartmentalize our view of heaven and remove its reality from our everyday lives and just leave it out there somewhere until the day comes that we die. The reality of heaven and what John sees here and records for us has practical implications right here and now for you and for me when it comes to our view of reality, when it comes to the living out of our faith, what we believe, that is a readiness to act as if what is believed really were so. So here stands an open door indicating that God is inviting John to enter this heaven where God's reign is being fully realized. God desires to disclose something important and thus opens a door. And then John hears a voice that booms like a trumpet. It's the voice that he had heard before in chapter 1 verse 10. It's the voice of Jesus. John is being invited into God's holy presence and it is fitting and necessary that Jesus be the mediator who grants him access into the throne room of the holy God. Jesus says, I will show you what must take place after this. G.K. Beale in his commentary notes that Revelation 4.1 introduces not only chapter 4 and chapter 5, but also the rest of the visions throughout the whole book on into chapter 22. It becomes clear, therefore, that all the visions about to unfold concern events throughout the church age, past, present, and future. Some may have already unfolded, others await fulfillment, and yet others have multiple fulfillments throughout the church age. And in this connection, the New Testament is both consistent and clear in its view that the last days began with the resurrection of Christ. John is understanding Daniel's latter-day kingdom and tribulation as beginning now in John's own day, continuing to our own. John then experiences the reality of heaven in verses 2 through 8a. At once I was in the Spirit, and behold, a throne stood in heaven with one seated on the throne. And he who sat there had the appearance of jasper and carnelian, and around the throne was a rainbow that had an appearance of an emerald. Around the throne were 24 thrones, and seated on those thrones were 24 elders, clothed in white garments with golden crowns on their heads. And from the throne came flashes of lightning and rumblings and peals of thunder and before the throne were burning seven torches of fire, which are the seven spirits of God. And before the throne there was, as it were, a sea of glass-like crystal. And around the throne, on each side of the throne, are four living creatures full of eyes in front and behind. The first living creature like a lion, the second living creature like an ox, the third living creature with the face of a man, and the fourth living creature like an eagle in flight. And the four living creatures, each of them with six wings, are full of eyes all around and within. So now, we are introduced 
through John's prophetic vision to the most crucial truth concerning reality. The most crucial truth of all. And here it is, that in heaven there is a throne. In a realm that is more real and more lasting than anything you have ever seen with your eyes, there is a throne. And seated upon that throne, the language is symbolic, not literal. We're in uh, apocalyptic literature here. Seated on that throne is one of almost inexpressible beauty and glory and wealth, like brilliant, incandescent, precious stones. His throne represents His absolute sovereignty over all things. The most important truth about reality. With the many connections to Daniel, we may call to mind the humiliation of King Nebuchadnezzar and his subsequent restoration. In Daniel 4, 34 to 35, after his restoration, he makes this proclamation. At the end of the days, I, Nebuchadnezzar, lifted my eyes up to heaven, and my reason returned to me, and I blessed the Most High and praised and honored Him who lives forever. Why? For His dominion is an everlasting dominion. His kingdom endures from generation to generation. And all the inhabitants of the earth are accounted as nothing. And He does according to His will among all the host of heaven and among all the inhabitants of the earth, and none can ever stay his hand and say, what have you done? A throne reminds us there is someone in charge, someone who rules and reigns. And our experiences in life, both good and bad, are not random are not governed by chance or karma or luck. There is a God. He is a personal God. At the center of it all, there is an all-wise, all-powerful, all-knowing God of love and mercy seated on His throne. Imagine the difference that this would make in the midst of suffering. The pain is still real. The loss still triggers deep, shattering grief. But when there is a throne with this God seated upon the throne, reigning over all things, within this grief arises a strain of hope that is stronger than death itself. And yes, He is love. At the core of reality is a God of love. He abounds in steadfast love and mercy. Psalm 103 verse 8 says, The Lord is merciful and gracious, slow to anger, and abounding in steadfast love, which is why Revelation 4 has a rainbow around the throne. Now there's biblical imagery familiar to us. It takes us back to God's promises of mercy in the days of Noah, so that even as our God is sovereign, absolutely sovereign, rules and reigns from His throne, even as He does, He remembers mercy. He will be gracious to His people. Being told that the rainbow had the appearance of an emerald is meant to stretch our imaginations. If you say, what does that look like? You're supposed to say that. The book of Revelation just loves to do this. Put, put on your imagineer hat and jump in, into the jasper and the carnelian and the rainbow that looks like an emerald. 
It, it, it all immerses us into a rich and dense combination of mercy, awe, and beauty, as Wright puts it. In verse 4, there are thrones around the thrones. Not because the God seated on the throne has any rivals, but because he is a God who delegates his authority for carrying out his purposes. The 24 elders most likely represent a combination of the 12 tribes of Israel and the 12 apostles. And if so, they perfectly embody the people of God, Jews and Gentiles in one people of God, sharing now in the reign of God over his world through the achievements of Christ. They seem to be observers of the redemption here, not explicitly part of it though. So they may actually be angelic representatives of the twelve and the twelve, kind of like the angels of the churches that we met in chapters 2 to 3. But in any event, they receive their right to rule from God. And the reason we know this is because at the end of verse 10, they cast their crowns before the glassy sea. Because the, the authority and the victory belong completely to God, He is the source and He is the goal of it all. And standing there as John is allowed to see before the throne and the glassy sea and the, the colors and the rainbow, it's loud and bright in this environment. Rumblings and peals of thunder and flashes of lightning and torches of fire. The living creatures of verses 6 to 8 share many of the characteristics described elsewhere in Scripture. Ezekiel 1, Ezekiel 10, you know the story from Isaiah 6. They are full of eyes in front and behind and within to tell us of their vigilance in guarding the throne and in watching over all of God's creation. A constant reminder to us that you cannot just enter God's holy presence casually. Which brings us to what is happening in the presence of God's throne, verses 8b through 11. Day and night, they never cease to say, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty who was and is and is to come. They always said that. They're saying it right now and they will say it forever and ever day and night without ceasing. It's the truth. It's the true truth. It's the truth you build your life upon. They say it day and night. And whenever the living creatures give glory and honor and thanks to Him who is seated on the throne and who lives forever and ever, the 24 elders fall down before Him who is seated on that throne and they worship Him who lives forever and ever. And then they take their crowns off and they cast them before the throne saying, Worthy are you, our Lord and God, to receive glory and honor and power for you created all things and by your will they existed and were created. Here's what we were created for. When we get to the other side and hear those words, well done, good and faithful servant, enter into the joy of your master. This is what we will experience. Beholding the glory of God, worshiping him day and night without ceasing. And note the focus of the worship here. God's holiness and God's worthiness. This is the purest kind of worship. This is, this is the worship given nonstop in heaven. Worshiping God for His, He is holy. Worshiping Him because He is worthy. First, think of holiness. What exactly is holiness? J.I. Packer writes, the word signifies everything about God that sets Him apart from us. 
and makes him an object of awe, adoration, and dread to us. Holiness covers all aspects of his transcendent greatness and moral perfection and thus is an attribute of all of his attributes pointing us to the godness of God at every point, every facet of God's nature, every aspect of his character may properly be spoken of as holy just because it is his. The core of the concept is God's purity, which cannot tolerate any form of sin and thus calls sinners to constantly humble themselves in His presence. You are holy, holy, holy. It's the only attribute in the Bible repeated three times, back to back to back, just like this. Holy, you are holy. And then verse 11, God's worthiness. Why? Why is he deemed worthy in this verse to receive glory and honor and power? Why? That little connecting word for tells us why. Because he has created all things and they only remain in their existence by his will. You are worthy. You spoke out of nothing everything into existence that exists. And it is existing even today because you will that it be so. Who else is worthy like that? Only God. Only our holy God. You remember Clyde Kilby's means to mental health. I've shared points of them before. He has 11 principles that he lived by. The former literature uh, professor C.S. Lewis specialist from Wheaton College On his list, the way he maintained his mental health, number 10 and number 11 were these. Number 10, if for nothing more than the sake of a change of view, I shall assume my ancestry to be from the heavens rather than from the caves. And then number 11, to maintain your mental health, even if I turn out to be wrong, I shall bet my life on the assumption that this world is not idiotic, neither run by an absentee landlord, but that today, this very day, some stroke is being added to the cosmic canvas that in due time I shall understand with joy to be a stroke made by the architect who calls himself Alpha and Omega. It's like an anchor for your life to reality no matter what it throws at you. You believe that there is a throne and a God who sits upon that throne reigning over all things. This is the difference that a revelation for view of reality makes in all of life. If if your worship gets boring, it's not because of the songs. It's because you've kind of gone soft and fluffy on your view of God, His holiness, His worthiness. These creatures never tire day and night of declaring His holiness. And the, and the, the elders getting up and falling down and casting their crowns, you are worthy because you created all things and they exist by your will. In His great great classic work. If your worship's getting dull, then here's a place to go. J.I. Packer's knowing God. In that book, he says, those who know God have great energy for God, energy to defend Him when He's being trampled under feet, energy to pray to this God, great energy for God when you know Him. I think back 41 years ago, sitting in the front row in the middle of the arena at the University of Illinois at the Urbana Student Missions Conference, held every other year there. It was midnight, New Year's Eve. Billy Graham was preaching communion. We were about, 17,000 of us students were about to have communion together. For an ENFP like me, sitting in the front row, midnight, 
They stood up and just announced that Ayatollah Khomeini was named Times Man of the Year. It was just such a tension in the air, and yet here we were, 17,000 students. And what I remember most is all of us singing, hallelujah, what a savior. That's what I remember. And I remember thinking, because it's a missions conference, why shouldn't I go be a missionary? I thought it was like at that moment, it was sealed in my heart. God made me to teach the word of God to people, to expand the choir that sings his praises in heaven. People who love him with all their heart because they know him. When you know God, there is great energy for God. It's like that catapulted me into the last 41 years of my life so that I, I never get tired of doing what we're doing here today. Those who know God have great thoughts of God. Think of Daniel who said the most high rules over the kingdoms of man. Those who know God show great boldness for God. What they want to know is the right course and does God require, require this of them? Because if he does, in the words of Oswald Chambers, they smilingly wash their hands of any consequences. If this is the right course and God requires it, that's where I go. And those who know God have great contentment in God. No other peace like it when you know this God. Romans 8, who will bring any charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies. And you rest in Him. When you don't know Him, it's like you stumble through life blindfolded. You don't know why you're here. You don't know what you're trying to do. You don't know where you're going. Let me close with a view of the future because of Revelation 4. The future in the new heaven and the new earth when heaven becomes earth and when God's reign is fully realized. Won't that be a great day? Wayne Grudem says, from time to time here on earth we experience the joy of genuine worship of God and we realize that it is our highest joy to be giving Him glory. But in the new city, this joy will be multiplied many times over and we will know the fulfillment of that for which we were created. And our greatest joy will be seeing the Lord Himself and being with Him forever. When John speaks of the blessings of the heavenly city, the culmination of those blessings comes in the statement in the last chapter of Revelation, they shall see His face. And when we look into the face of our Lord, and when He looks back at us with infinite love, we will see in Him the fulfillment of everything that we know to be good and right and desirable in the universe. And as we gaze into the face of our Lord, we will then know more fully than ever before that it is in His presence that there is fullness of joy and that at His right hand are pleasures forevermore. Psalm 16 and 11. And then will be fulfilled the longing of our hearts with which we have cried out so many times in the past. Psalm 27, 4. One thing I ask of you, Lord, one thing I seek, that I might dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life and behold your beauty. And we finally see the Lord face to face. Our hearts will want nothing else. Whom have I in heaven but you? And what else do I desire on earth but you? You are the strength of my heart and you are my portion forever. And then with joy in our hearts and in our voices, we will join together with all the redeemed 
from all the ages and with the mighty armies of heaven, and we will sing out, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, who was and who is and who is to come. Pray with me. Lord, we, we just run after so many things in life and we worry about so many things, but we know that the greatest need in each of our lives and in this church is that there would be a renewed appreciation of your holiness and your worthiness. We thank you for that open door in heaven that gave us a glimpse at your throne and who you are as you reign over our lives and this world. And we long for the day, we just hunger and thirst for the day when we will see you face to face and finally be at home. But until that day, Lord, quicken your people, awaken us, raise us from the dead. Grant us, I pray, a renewed vision of how great you are in all of your holiness and in all of your worthiness. Do this, Lord, because you are worthy, and do it because it is our greatest need, we pray through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen.